I want to thank the panel for their comments. I know that a number of you have been very patient uh, in waiting to get a chance to ask questions. If you want to direct your question to a specific panelist, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll open it up. I see you back here, but there's a young woman back here who's been very patient, had her hand up first. So we'll, we'll start with you. We've got a mic coming around. Thanks, Irene. Thank you. Um, I was saying that I'm writing and publishing a book that will be out for Christmas called Blacks Living Green in Small Smart Steps, apropos your point. It's the common sense things that you can do. And so I'm trying to identify black people uh, throughout America who are you know, greening the way that they live, uh, defined broadly in terms of their investing, their, how, they, how they do the holidays, how they live in their house, etc. So if any of you fall in that category, <laughs> please see me afterwards. But the reason for my uh, uh, wanting to ask a question is that I had an opportunity to meet with uh, T. Boom Pickens this week, and he was looking for support among black people for his, uh, his energy plan. And I got a copy of that, and in fact, what he was saying with regard particularly to the transportation piece. and. Um, uh, having new trucks use natural gas certainly seemed to make a lot of sense to me, um, but I'm an economist. I'm not, you know, I'm not an energy expert, and it seemed to be no-brainer correct to me. But when you say educate ourselves, when I look through his plan, you know, it's it's you know, you really have to know how to evaluate you know, these plans, and, and you can't easily do that. And so I was very elated after I met with him, but then the next day I met with a representative of uh, a big oil company, and he was explaining about the difficulties of having the infrastructure to deliver what he was saying. So it just underscores the point of how difficult it is to be educated on this. So I think my bottom line question to any of the panelists is, have you seen that T. Boom Pickens plan, and what do you think about it, especially in relationship to perhaps its impact on black people? Because that's what he was asking me for the support of the black community for that plan. Thank you. Let me, let me just answer this, this way, your question this way. Um, in, in Atlanta, we have uh, the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, uh, MARTA. And for years, uh, white people call it uh, MARTA, but it was, they said it's still for moving Africans rapidly through Atlanta. And if you divided the region in half, where MARTA went, uh, Interstate 20, north of Interstate 20, mostly white people, south, mostly black people. And we worked with some community groups um, in, in Atlanta, in MARTA. MARTA covers Fulton, DeKalb counties, and, and the city of Atlanta. We did a study, and we showed that the newer buses, it's one system now. The newer buses um, were compressed natural gas, CNG buses, handicap accessible, new, all north, <coughs> dirty diesel buses, raggedy ass buses, south. <laughs> our, our, we work with these people, our people, and we got an administrative complaint filed, took them F with the FTA, and uh, busted them. And they decided, okay, well, we're going to. The, question, the reason why they said that they were, we couldn't have any CNG buses south of uh, I-20 is because there are no uh, bus barns uh, set up infrastructure-wise to handle CNG. They put the CNG bus barns uh, in the white areas to handle the buses. And so we said, well, build new barns. <laughs> so the, the question of, of was not technology. It was a matter of decisions made that black people, since many, many cases, were transit dependent south of I-20. People north of I-20 were choice riders, people who could give up that Lexus and get on, on a bus. And so the infrastructure is very important. You know, if you talk about CNG, um, uh, right now, um, what's the bro, big brown? Um, UPS. UPS. Most of the UPS is, um, fleets are, are CNG. If you talk about converting from these old diesel trucks, the, uh, the uh, garbage trucks that run ripping up and down our areas, uh, our school buses, 
conversion. We're talking about lots of fleets, taxis. And so if there are uh, city uh, and government uh, vehicles, these are things they're, they're gradually conver uh, converting. And so it makes a lot of sense if we talk about uh, these kinds of things. So infrastructure-wise, there has to be investments made in putting this in place. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense, and CNG is much uh, um, it, much cleaner than than these these old you know diesel buses. Absolutely, diesel fleets. Any of the other panelists want to take on the question about T Boone Pickens' plan, Trevor? Um, I have studied his plan. Um, I know it quite well. Uh, I'll just make a couple quick comments. First, the price of natural gas in this country has increased by 500 percent over the last five years. And as of a year and a half ago, we thought we were going to run out of natural gas. Prices were spiking to $14, $15 in MMBTU, where it was $2 forever. Uh, recently, they have found some new shale formations, Marcellus Shale, Barnett Shale, large um, shale formations where they're horizontally drilling into these shale formations to, to pull more natural gas out. The ability to pull that out and the economics to pull it out are really going to decide whether or not it's worthwhile to build the infrastructure. To go directly to his plan, the biggest point he's trying to do is get a huge subsidy put in for, a, for wind farms, uh, particularly in his one wind farm in the, down in West Texas. Uh, and I think it's a matter of whether or not as, as a policy we want to pick winner and losers on technology. I can't sit here today and say I know what the right technology is. I will tell you I don't believe the long-term technology for this country is wind. I don't believe it works uh, the way we need the electrical infrastructure to work. And he's asking us to bet a tremendous amount of taxpayer dollars on a plan that picks a winner. I'm not sure that that's a winner. If I was going to try to pick a winner today, I would pick solar. I would not pick wind. Let me <clears throat> add, in terms of CNG, compressed natural gas, uh, Yesterday, there was a release from Toyota. Toyota will now resume building uh, Camry CNG vehicles. They are taking a different look at uh, CNG from what <clears throat> the outlook was four or five years ago, because everything has changed. The average equivalency of a CNG gallon, a therm, what we would call a gallon if you pumping at the pump, is now about $2.30, I believe, whereas you know what you plan for good old gasoline. So a new look is being taken at uh, CNG. And clearly there are some of the problems that Trevor uh, indicate in terms of extracting natural gas, but natural gas now is being perceived more favorably. Uh, windmills, <laughs> if you ever come to Northern California, uh, go over the uh, Altamont Pass, you will see those blades turning. Uh, I don't think anybody seriously saying that windmills, you, you rely solely on them. But the, the, the point is that they are part of the mix, and we're going to have a mix of a whole lot of renewable-type energies. Uh, there, so uh, I think we have to look at it from that perspective. It probably will never contribute more than maybe optimistically 10 to 15 percent, but but that becomes important when you get everything else in the mix. Great, thank you. I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, we seem to now have a process. I know I've had a few hands up for some other questions, but Irene has the mic, so I think if you want to come up to the mic, that'll sort of facilitate the questions and make sure we had it re recorded. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, my name is. Sonny, um, I am an energy specialist. Um, the question that I have for the panel is, um, United States is ranked first in terms of coal reserve. They are like the um, middle, middle East in terms of coal reserve. Why aren't they utilizing it? I understand there's a technology that does um, um, use clean coal energy, and somehow they're not touching the dirty one. But they could invest um, fund to improve that also, and they don't really need a um, nuclear plant, if you look at it. They could utilize coal and stay away from nuclear because nuclear is highly ris risky. If you can look at past history, the way incident has occurred, and there is a potential that more could happen. And plus, with the um, um, processing, they are still digging it. Even though you get the price two for one, they are still burying it. So it's highly still risky. So my question is, why aren't they utilizing coal more? Okay. All right. Who wants to uh, lead off with that question? Nia? Um, I'll just make a couple quick responses. Coal does make up um, 
a very large amount of you know our utility production. Uh, the problem that comes with coal is the fact that it is absolutely filthy. Um, you can ask the people who are living in the valleys below the mountains where they're doing mountaintop removal in Appalachia. You can ask the communities that are surrounded by coal-fired power plants who have extremely high levels of asthma and other bronchial diseases. Um, we can't continue to solely focus on coal, no matter how much coal we have in the reserves, because it's dirty and it's killing and polluting our community. The, in California, we don't have any coal-fired power plants for obvious reasons. They do not, at the moment, meet the uh, standards. Uh, <clears throat> I hear the, <laughs> the word clean coal. Of course, uh, that's impossible. It, right. it's, it should be cleaner coal, not clean coal, because it's, it's still going to emit, uh, emit CO2s. So uh, uh, coal perhaps is something that uh, in certain areas people want to take a look at, but it's not coming anywhere close to California in the near future. Uh, that's why uh, we are rapidly looking at other alternatives other than, uh, than coal. And, and I would encourage uh, the technology to continue to work on it. But right now, it's just not where it should be in terms of meeting the standards in California. Dr. Washington? Well, as some of you know, uh, uh, China is building a new coal uh, uh, power plant uh, every week. <laughs> and uh, India is, is increasing its production, too. Now, interestingly, just a few weeks ago, uh, the Chinese people had gotten fed up with all the pollution. And, and, and they're actually mounting probably the biggest alternate energy program. And they can do it very, very rapidly since they are essentially in a dictatorship. Uh, so if the, if the top says that we're going to do this, um, they can do it. Whereas in a, a democracy like we are, we spend a lot of time debating whether we should do something or not. You know, and I wouldn't be so surprised if, uh, if China in 10 years will end up being the, the most sophisticated country in the world in terms of alternate energy sources. Uh, I hate to say that because we have the opportunity with the technology that we have existing, and we should be leading on the, on the charge. But we argue so much. Uh, in the legislative process that we don't really make a decision about what way to go. Sounds like that could be a whole other panel. But, <laughs> we, we'll go to the next question. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Miro Kovacevic from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I would like to comment first on, uh, you know, another scheme that rich people are selling to us, this passing wind and gas, big flatulence scheme. You know, I, I really encourage you to look into the plan. It's bad on both accounts. And it's, it's almost like this monetarist, you know, fluff there. And I would really uh, ask people not to be responsible in, in such a way, but just to say, well, the plan is good and, and essentially advertise it. Uh, I don't have time to elaborate why it's bad. Uh, Neither that is fundamentally critical at this point. More important that I would like to invite academic community is to have something called moral horizon. Uh, we, I don't think any solutions that we're trying to find here are sufficiently responsible for next 350 generations, which is a revelational cycle that we have. We have to look plus minus 7,000 years here to select the options. And the only options are obviously astronuclear, which is solar, and geothermal, which is the, the heat of the, of the planet. Anything else is really irresponsible for generations to come. And from that, there are technological solutions out there. I'm working with Governor Richardson and others down in. And the point is, I just think that we should not deceive, distract, and you know, sell uh, schemes just because of our tyranny of malice, because we are greedy, we want to hear for now, just for us. What about generations and generations to come? And we can solve it very fast, but I think bad ideas lead to bad consequences, and particularly bad plans, so thank you. 
All right, appreciate that comment. Um, go to the next question. I'll keep my comments brief. Dr. Washington, Ms. Robinson, and Dr. Bullard, your work on environmental justice has been simply outstanding. And so I just wanted to thank you for the incredible work that you've been doing. The, the question that I have is, is that what we've discovered, I'm an attorney, I'm also deeply involved in the religious community. What we've been able to do is push on the energy company to develop a relationship, a relationship that says, look, using many of the principles, Ms. Robinson, that you pioneered so very well, we've been able to say, look, there's no better people to be at the table to talk about environmental justice than those who are affected the most by it. And what we've discovered is when we develop these relationships and we're doing honest brokering with the utility and energy companies, then we're getting results. We're saying that this is what we think the community needs, this is what we think you ought to be doing, and guess what? They're listening. My question is, who better, for example, on the issue of nuclear, which, you know, wh wherever you stand on it, we have to admit that the emissions are less harmful than coal-fired emissions. Granted, there are some challenges, but who better, Ms. Robinson, than people like you and me to be at some of these Nuclear Regulatory Commission meetings and, you know, pointing out that environmental impact, the impact that it has on the economy, the sociological impacts on the community have to be taken in consideration when you build these power plants. If we're there, if we're having the conversations with the policymakers and the producers, don't you think that we have an awesome opportunity to marry the interest of the community with the interest of the producers and with the interest of the consumers? Thanks again for your incredible work in this area. Absolutely. Yeah, do you want to um, well, I say, I'm going to first say thank you um, and also say that I absolutely can't take credit for pioneering the principles either of, you know, just climate policy or the environmental justice principles, especially since I was just a kid when the environmental <laughs> justice principles were written. Um, I think, you know, I, I think that what you're saying is important that we should, should have a seat at the table. We should be having these conversations with industry. Um, but in, in terms of nuclear, no matter where you stand on the issue, what I will say is while, yes, it's important for folks like you and me and Dr. Bullard and other folks in this room to be at that table, it's also extremely important for the people who are living on the reservations where we are mining this uranium to be at that table and be a part of that conversation. We cannot keep pushing that out of the conversation. We can talk about how clean it is, we can talk about how much better than coal it is, but I'm sure that there are some people who are living next to a uranium mine who would beg to differ. Uh, the, when I mentioned early the environmental justice policy uh, of a Pacific Gas and Electric Company, and I'm advocating and have been uh, through the NEJAC, uh, that every corporation should have an environmental justice policy. If you did, what you advocate would be automatically because you would never cite a facility without first engaging long before you apply for the permit in that particular dialogue with the impacted community. So it would really resolve a lot of problems. And we found out in our operations at PG&E, uh, if we engage people first in the location of any facility, the chances of getting that facility approved goes way up. But if you try to locate a facility without that type of engagement, forget it. It's just unlikely to happen in the 21st century. Uh, uh, what we have um, in environmental justice, we call it the grandmother test. And we say that um, when citing a facility, uh, cited and operated uh, as if your grandmother lived next door and we know that most of us will not poison grandma I heard you say most I didn't say <laughs> there are some it's about, it's about the Benjamin it's all about the money <laughs> Dr. Washington, do you want to say anything, or do we go to the next question? Uh, no, I, all I'll say is amen. <laughs> all right, sir. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I've enjoyed the majority of the comments that I've heard so far, but I did have a specific question concerning housing and the green economy. I'm a real estate developer in, uh, based in Baltimore, Maryland, 
and I've been looking into getting more involved in green buildings and LEED certified housing, but I've found that it's been kind of difficult to get the information and to kind of navigate through the system to uh, find information about that. And I think that's a problem that, like you were mentioning before, um, kind of affects our community disproportionately because we're not really exposed to those kind of opportunities. As uh, the gentleman Trevor said, he took his children to a wind farm. And I know that, I know, some of the young people can also attest that I didn't even know there were wind farms. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, <laughs> uh, and I'm educated. I just graduated from uh, Howard University School of Law. So I'm going to become one of the uh, winners of the uh, rulers of the world one day. Um, but... <laughs> The, the, the reason I'm asking this question is because I wanted to see if the panel had any suggestions as to how um, young people can kind of get more invested into the green economy because I wasn't even involved until I talked to some other developers and they talked about the economic potential given the housing market and how you can separate yourself by creating green um, renovated buildings and residential and commercial buildings. And a lot of times our young people in our community are looking for ways to get money as opposed to, you know, just investing in it because we, we like the idea of it. We want to know how can we benefit economically and how can we also invest entrepreneurially into this uh, topic. So the panel had any suggestions, I would be yes. more than happy to hear I do. Uh, those signs. Uh, just quickly, in Northern California, there is a sister who has a construction company. It's the only certified green construction company uh, uh, owned by an African American in Northern California. Afterwards, see me, I'll give you her website, give you her telephone number. She will be more than happy. She's an outstanding uh, young sister that, that's doing tremendous work in the area of green building. And our business is doing green, Greening of the economy on environment and health, how we build, how to build smarter and healthier communities. All that is, I mean, all of this is interrelated. So, uh, so I think that, um, it's it, oftentimes you just have to know how to um, how to how to frame your search when you're looking for something. You know the keywords; it'll come up. And there's lots of information. There's lots of black people doing this work. That's right. You know we don't get in the New York Times or Atlanta Journal Constitution. In order to get in the Atlanta Journal Constitution in Atlanta, you got to kill somebody. <laughs> but anyway, there are a lot of good people doing great work. But uh, it's just not you know it's not just that public. It's still invisible. I am going to, we're going to move to the next question, but I am also going to step down. Um, Congresswoman Kilpatrick is back, and uh, it's great to have her back. Uh, so thank you all. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll continue. Thank you, sir. Say your name, please. Sterling Washington. I've got actually two questions. The first uh, has to do with the panel's thoughts on the offshore drilling ban expiring. Um, my thoughts are that we should be weaning ourselves off oil and concentrating on alternatives like electric cars and prolonging this is just making things worse. Um, my second question is very uh, specific. I work for an organization called the International Federation of Black Prides, which holds about, I think it's at this point, 27 Black Pride celebrations around the country every year. And last year we had about 350,000 people in attendance. One of our educational initiatives for next year is a campaign to educate the black community. And, and IFBP focuses on the black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community about um, environmental issues and I wanted the panel's uh, thoughts on how, where I should look for educational materials and I'll be in touch with the commission um, about that, but just your thoughts on what, your bank, on sir? what, what state be, are you from? Oh, I'm from DC. Okay. But the, the Federation has it's national. prides and yeah, mm -hmm. it's actually international. But international, excuse yes. me. I stand corrected. <laughs> Thank you so you're right. But domestically twenty seven. All right. Um, Thank you very much. We've and got so that. one of the oh, 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 we gotta keep going. That's good. Okay. That too. Oh, the first one was on drilling. Who would like yeah. to answer that? I probably uh, let let, really must have let you all just talk and talk. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> all right. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Here we go. Hey, Here we go. No, no, please. Okay. Let's take the first one first on offshore drilling. Anyone? Dom. Uh, let me ask this, the, the second part. Uh, oh, well, hold on, hold on. Read my 14 Anybody, anybody want to answer the first part about drilling, offshore drilling? Please, doctor. Uh, yeah, I would. 
Go ahead. Now, <laughs> two doctors. Come on, both of you. You, you can go first, sir. No, I can. I can answer that. I'll give you my thoughts on it. Uh, offshore drilling. Uh, obviously, it's something that is political, and some people are advocating. But you got to remember. You can only get 3% of our needs out there. If you drill, <laughs> drill now, and even start <laughs> drilling down here, it's not a realistic al alternative for what we need to do. We sent a man to the moon uh, back in the early 60s uh, in a, just a short period of time because we resolved ourselves to do it. If we decide to wean ourselves off of oil and wars, then we will be able to mm -hmm. think beyond oil and do yeah. something that is constructive and mm -hmm. actually solve the energy problems of this nation. They are not problems that cannot be solved. It's yeah. just the will to do it. Thank you. That's okay. And I'm going to add some too, please. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would just add to that, that I don't think it's a long-term solution for us. So we can drill and drill, but it's not going to get us there. Yeah. Electrification of vehicles, uh, interesting subject, right? The cost, to, the equivalent cost of a gallon of gas to a gallon of electricity to run a car is one-tenth. Um, we've been stuck in low gear for years around electrification of vehicles. We finally started to see some momentum being from Detroit where the, the big three are. We're seeing a lot of push towards electric, uh, electrification. But this concept of energy storage is something we have to work on. It's a high-tech industry. Somebody mentioned earlier about China becoming the most high-tech industry. They're going to solve this issue, not us. They have a fundamental matter of public policy that they're pushing this. We're not, right? We're worried about drilling offshore that's not going to fundamentally help us long term. So I think it's just a matter of having the right public policies that push the right investments in the right place. And, and a little another tidbit on that, for those in the room, on September 30th, our drill, ban on drilling expires. It's a 40 year something that's about to expire. The House did pass legislation that said 50 years, 50 uh, yard, mm, miles, 50 miles and out, that you could, could drill. The Senate did not want to take it up, but as the speakers have said, drilling won't answer what we need. It's alternatives, it's new directions, it's electricity, it's wind, it's solar. All of that's going to make a difference in the next decade or now, or else we'll be way behind the rest of the world as we try to wean ourselves off this oil that's produced somewhere else. So that, those are good ones. Now, just quickly on his second part. Um, and, uh, so, Doctor, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, easily. Just read my 14 books. <laughs> <laughs> Any one of them in particular, or half a couple chapters or anything? You can read them in the order in which they were published. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to have you talk to him right after we break up. All right. Please, I come on. I wanted to just real quick, there are, there are other organizations around the country um, who have curriculums and resources that are, you know, they're using to train organizations and grassroots communities around the country in issues of climate justice and environmental justice. Um, the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Initiative is one of them, and we can definitely talk after the panel. Thank you. Your name, sir? Hi. Hello, hello. There we go. Uh, Congresswoman Kilpatrick and all the panelists, thank you very much this afternoon. My name is DJ Pierce. I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, oh. but currently living in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm working on a documentary right now on African Americans and their involvement, or perhaps lack thereof, in the Green Movement. And as we've seen today and heard, there is definitely an involvement, but also with regard to low-income families. What... Um, Looking back at some of the statistics that you guys gave earlier with regard to African Americans contributing less than 20% with regard to greenhouse emissions, is the focus or should the focus be on individuals being more energy conscious, like African American individuals, especially in low income neighborhoods and families, or is, should the focus be on large companies? And if it's on large companies, what tactics are we using to kind of get the message out there, especially in regard to low-income families in the African-American community? Okay. Um, well, right now, the problem that we're facing, especially if you, want, if you start to look at the issue strictly as an individual issue, is that sustainability is really expensive. You know, um, we're starting to see subsidies and lower costs in compact fluorescent light bulbs, but, you know, the idea of eating organically, of buying a hybrid vehicle, and just, you know, the whole idea of being sustainable and more ecologically conscious is extremely expensive. So we can't simply focus on 
individuals and then try to put that financial burden of sustainability back on the communities that have been hurt the worst. What we do have to do is start to have conversations around corporate, corporate accountability and really working and pushing to create strong, just climate policies that push for corporate responsibility, that push for you know, ensuring that polluters are paying to pollute and that that revenue that is generated is put into energy efficiency and put back into the communities that have been harmed the most. Excellent. Let me, let me add Excellent. that it's the responsibility actually is on both. Uh, the corporations and the individual, uh, no matter what income level you com uh, come okay. from, there are some things that you can do. You can flip off a light switch when you go out of the room and on and on and on. So I'm not going to say that there's no responsibility there. But it's a joint responsibility between the corporation to work with the community. There are a number of programs that are out there in terms of weatherization and all other kind, in including getting the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, efficient light bulbs. Uh, oftentimes you can get them free. And many times the utilities have uh, uh, programs that offer those to uh, so-called low-income people. So there are many opportunities there to work together with the local utility as well as the community. It's a matter of taking advantage of it. And, and government certainly has a piece in that. Absolutely. So I would say all oh, the corporate, individually, our governments on all levels, we all have a responsibility in that. Excellent question. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir? <coughs> We've got about 10 minutes. Well, obviously, you know what state I'm from, <laughs> your state. Uh, my name is no, Dave Libet. I'm that. from Michigan. Um, and my question is, I've, um, and it's going to be specifically directed to you, doctor. I know we have um, coal, we have um, hydro, which the Chinese that live downstream, by the way, are not happy. Um, and we have nuclear, of course. And all three of those, and we all appear to be on the same train in the, in the the byproducts produced by all these things are obviously a great issue, in this case, fossil fuels. Um, and my specific question is, is that your model, and I was hoping somebody else would answer this before I got here, but they didn't. But um, at some point, um, the emissions that are being generated are, no matter what we do, really is going to make a, a difference because the results are going to be irreversible. At what point does your model say we're going to reach that point because most of the time businesses will never do anything and this is a profit in for them. The government isn't going to usually react and no reflection upon the government <laughs> isn't really, really going to react until it's an emergency. So at what point does your model say, it, 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 from listening to everybody, it reminds me of being on an airplane when I go past the tower. Um, <laughs> the guy can't stop if he see a, a door at the end of the runway. We're on the plane for the ride. At what point does your model tell me I'm at that point? Yeah, I th well, I think uh, from, our, from our modeling studies, as we, as we see the, the climate warming up uh, substantially, uh, that we have really two choices. If we, uh, if we stay on the same path until the end of this century, which we'll, we, hopefully I'll have some grandchildren who are still living at that point, uh, we will have catastrophic change, as I outlined in my earlier talk. In other words, the no, temperature is going to warm up three or four degrees more uh, than it is now. We'll essentially have sea level that will probably be up, you know, maybe about two or three feet above sort of where it is right now, in the worst case. Now, uh, one of the things we can do in our models is we can ask the question, where should we realistically try to stabilize on the climate and and we yeah, carry out those those studies and um, on supercomputers I, I should add but huge ones you know uh, supercomputers bigger than this room and, and we uh, can say that we need to start cutting the emissions by roughly 70 to 80 percent now it's interesting that Obama's um, uh, suggestion of, of essentially cutting emissions by 80 percent uh, by 2050, it'll save us a lot. Uh, uh, okay. Senator McCain's uh, target is closer to 50 percent. But either one of those two would really save us. Uh, but if we don't make the change uh, in the next uh, two or three decades, then we are on the path that can't be reversed very easily. And the reason is, is once on the ice melts over 
over Greenland and and the glaciers and the rest Which of the Which is happening world. as we speak. Yeah. If those melt, uh, then, then the level of sea level will be so high, and there's no way that you can cool things off until on the next ice age comes. So the answer is it really behooves all of those, and you mentioned government and private industry and individuals. We all have a partnership in this, right. and everyone because of what's happening. It's real. Uh, the doctor mentioned earlier before some of you came in, most of us remember that um, Al Gore won a Pulitzer Prize for well, something in truth, inconvenient, inconvenient truth. truth, but the gentleman on the end was part of that as well. So it's, we're kind of being forced to do this, government as well as business as well as individuals. It's, it's, it's real. It's not, it's not a, a movie. You know? <laughs> Come on, young lady, let's go. We've got about 10 minutes and another, person, another group has the room. So I was given one minute, so I'm going to try. Uh -huh, okay. Um, I'm Dr. Beverly Wright, Director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice at Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana. And my, I really have a, a comment, not so much a question. And that is that um, living in Louisiana, you know, we have been plummeted by, everybody knows about Katrina, now Gustav, and, and Ike, which also scared us. But what some people don't know is that Louisiana has as much oil as Texas and more natural gas, but we're still a very poor state. Um, offshore drilling is part of the reason that we were impacted by Katrina. Um, it has completely destroyed our coast, so we had no protection from surge that came. My concern is that we keep responding to economic fears and not at all taking into consideration what the, the kind of um, processes that we're pushing to deal with our economics will affect us later in really devastating ways. I, I wanted to ask one question, and that was, how many people in here know what the Hanford site is in Washington State? It is... Very few. But yes, it's a, it's a huge site that holds a nuclear waste. I mean, and if you ever saw that, that we cannot get rid of, and it's just yeah. sitting out there. And if we keep producing stuff that we have no way of getting rid of in order to respond to an immediate economic need, the Katrina that we experience will be happening all over, not to mention the catastrophic impacts that we'll have from climate change. So climate change needs to be included in any decision that we make about moving forward as it relates to energy. Thank you very much. I'd like very to follow good. up with you, Doctor, too. Thank you very much. Next. Good, morning. good afternoon. Good afternoon. And who are the cadets? We're on the, ste on the steps <laughs> of the Capitol. Uh, who are you representing? Um, T.C. Williams High School. Oh, okay. That's Jack. Ah, right, yeah. Right. One shout out for T.C. Williams over there on the right. Okay, please. Um, I would like to ask um, Nia Robinson uh, about two questions. You mentioned health issues um, caused by pollution in African American communities and low, uh, low income communities uh, besides asthma. What are some of these health issues, and also who are addressing this problem? Um, well, the issues range from, you know, like I said, asthma, bronchial diseases, to cancer, diabetes, and it also an increase in sudden infant death syndrome in our communities, um, develop, developmental disabilities, um, birth defects, low birth weight, high increases in infant mortality, um, the list goes on and on. There are groups all over the country, environmental justice organizations and environmental health organizations that are working to address those issues on a, level, on a local level. Um, I'm sure that you know, there's a, a list of those types of organizations on Dr. Bullard's site. You can also look at the EJCC website and see some of our members who are working locally to deal with that. Hi, um, I, I'm Felicia Davis, and I have the pleasure to work on occasion with Dr. Bullard and Nia and others on um, climate justice in particular. And my question centers around equity, but more in a global context. We talk a lot about our energy use, and if we look at Africa today, it really is a dark continent in that there is no light. Um, if we're looking at development and we kind of look at China and India and we see what happens when they come online, a concern that I have is any place that has energy poverty and what kind of thinking and recommendations and, and factoring we're doing to include 
the need for development on some level and the desperate need for energy um, on a vast level, how do we factor that in to our policy decision making and advocacy uh, today? So that, that's my question. Excellent. Anyone here to have that one? Well, I just, just just say that climate justice is not a domestic issue, it's an international issue. And environmental justice may have started in Warren County, North Carolina back in 82, but it is an international. And what happens in the south side of Chicago is very similar to what happens in, in Nigeria, in Ogoni, and in, in other parts of the world. So I, I think we have to look at it as an international issue because it's the same, the same companies that, that, that do harm in um, South Louisiana, in Cantor Alley, they st they're the same companies that operate in Durban, uh, in um, Colombia, and in South Africa, and Nigeria. And so it's, um, there is no allegiance uh, other than the, the, well, I was going to say the dollar, but the dollar is worthless. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks for the optimism there. Uh, <laughs> but the, the question in terms of policy and what would move us in that direction, we're going to end on some of that with the final comments, but please, sir. Thank you for that. We're going to come back to some of And also to Nia's list of the various illnesses that are associated. Thank you so much. I'm Ralph Page, working with Federation of Southern Cooperatives with Farmers. We're working with, we're into the whole climate deal here, working with uh, uh, African-American farmers setting up uh, 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 carbon sequestration program where farmers are getting involved in no-till and forestry and so forth. We're finding it very difficult to get the government resources that other large white organizations get to help initiate these initiatives or get the attention of the large utility companies to work in these communities. That then, of course, I'm very concerned with the economic part of it. And none of None of the cases, poor communities, we are in 100 of the poorest communities in the country using cooperatives. Nobody, and how do we get some economic benefit of making some of these things that it's going to take to, to do these things? I'm talking about this is now. We don't have time to wait 20 years. The communities are poor. I'm holding my hand. A light bulb, one of the ones y'all talked about, is made in China. Why can't we do an initiative to do this in Sumter County, Alabama, or some other poor community to create jobs and economic benefits from this. The only okay. thing that okay. most black stop, folks stop do is right turn there, the sir. switch on and white folk make the damn bulb. Okay, hold a minute. <laughs> but wait a minute. Let's talk about, we'll take that back. This is like a discussion. We're all making guys mad now. China had the wherewithal that one of them, y'all better learn Chinese. But wait, sir, come back to the mic. You, you say you're part of a cooperative yeah. that has interest in this. And we want to make it the wherewithal so perhaps your cooperatives might want to produce and manufacture some things. Is that the question? Yes. We, we and are. How do, how do we are an association of cooperatives with 30,000 right. families, 10,000 farmers throughout the South, and we've been working on the energy-related stuff. We started years ago working on coal, doing the solar heating units to go on houses for heat and those kinds of things, and we continue to work on it. And so your question it. is how can you partner with larger corp corporations? Yeah, just, it was just a suggestion more that letting people know that we're in the carbon credit deal and that if they're, the energy people are interested in working with us, black there over there over. Uh, and so the uh, question is, how land. do they help you get into some of that? Yes. Okay, Will stop right there. Let's see what let's see what the answer might be. We have a corporation here. We have a couple at the table. Why don't you take it? Sure. Um, first, I have to address carbon sequestration. Um, so carbon sequestration is something we're all looking at, right? And. I would argue with you, uh, or I would agree with you, that the funding is not adequate to investigate carbon sequestration. But with any new technology, you're going to have beta sites where to do carbon sequestration, you need particular geological formations to exist in order to sequester the carbon. It's unknown how that technology will work, but what we do have to do is find the best beta sites in the country to try it. Fortunately, we're gifted in Michigan, and in northern Michigan, we have geological formations that hold not only vast amounts of natural gas that we store there, but we also believe have the opportunity to store vast amounts of carbon if we can do carbon sequestration correctly. The biggest issue surrounding carbon sequestration is what happens if it migrates once we stick it underneath the ground. Nobody clearly understands the liability issues associating with injecting carbon into the ground, and if it shows up, 
300 miles from where you injected it into the ground. How do you get involved in it? You know, there's four or five beta sites that are out there that companies are involved in. It's, um, I'll go back to what Dr. Bullard said. I think it's all pre pretty well out there on who's leading those uh, beta sites. But to get funding for a beta site, um, extremely difficult. You know, and just from a, so we won't keep going. Thank you very much for that. It is the internet. No, the internet. You have to stand on straight up. You there, George? We're going to kind of bring, wrap it up. But I would implore all of everyone in the room who has an interest yeah. in this. Get on the internet. And I, I had to go vote, but I'm sure some of the people mentioned that there are sites all over the internet, Absolutely. various sites all around the world and within our own country that can assist in some of that. The federal government, unfortunately, is not a good partner at this time. But I think as we move to alternatives and we move to this urgency that we have to do to control the climate and all that, you'll see much more of that. I suggest you get ready for it and do the legwork for it and the research in your own development and then come to us and let us help you push it forward. No, don't give them that <laughs> <laughs> <Give it up>. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> well, we look forward to working with you, sir. One on one. We'll talk one on one. Thank you, Irene. But we do appreciate you. <laughs> That's a whole nother discussion. But we need to have all of that. That's a, and we want to grow you because we want young people here to know that when they're educated in these various disciplines, that we have the opportunities to own their own business and to work in corporate to do some of the things we're talking about today. Thank you, sir. And I am going to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. You have the last word, sir. Hi, my name is Randall Ripton. I'm from uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, there was a lot of talk about cutting individual waste for like a person to like change their carbon footprint. And I just wanted to know, like Detroit is a 90% African-American city. Uh, there's no recycling program. There's an incinerator that supplies energy. And I just want to know, like, like what can the caucus, uh, you know, congressional black caucus, do to like help us? That's not for this. Let's just talk on one on one. Ask them a question. But while we have them here, you know, recycling, we have to do that. We have to conserve in our own. We got to lose the light bulbs. We got to work with any energy efficient companies, and we'll do that across America. There's not the federal or state dollars in America or in our states to help urban America like we need to. But that doesn't say we shouldn't do it. We should start where we are and begin to do some of that. The universities have a role to play. We've got to help the universities with funding from the federal level so that young people like yourselves who want those kind of curricula and want those kind of opportunities have, have access to higher education where you can learn that. But uh, no, don't let let him ask one of them something. I, I would like to actually respond about the, the incinerator. Yeah, being, good. being from Detroit, I drove down I-75 I was driven down I-75 on my way to school and saw that incinerator every day. And I understand um, the sense of urgency and it just, just the anger and the fact that curbside recycling isn't even an option in our city. And not only do we burn the trash from our city, but we burn it from surrounding cities also. Um, I would urge you to get in touch with an organization called Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice. The, the executive director, her name is Donnell Wilkins, and they've been working avidly on the issue around the incinerator. Um, you could also get in touch with a woman named Rhonda Anderson who's running the Sierra Club's EJ program, but definitely talk to Donnell Wilkins and the staff at DWEJ. You can reach them at W, their phone number is actually 313-833. No, 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 <laughs> website, website. Or www.dwej.org. And that's two organizations. Mitch McGinn, your website was one at Sierra. Um, and you can also talk to uh, the woman named Rhonda Anderson. She works for the Sierra Club's Environmental Justice Program in Detroit. And you we, can, at the sierraclub.org. Good points. You can find good it. points. <laughs> Doctor, please. Yeah, Detroit, uh, Detroit has a unique status as being the only major metropolitan area in the country that does not have a regional transit system. It has two bus systems that's not connected. Detroit makes cars, or it used to. Uh, and so I think there's, to get, uh, to reduce the carbon footprint, there is uh, a need for, uh, for having a truly regional transit system, not just in name, so that you can get that 34% of black people who are in Detroit that don't own cars to get to where those jobs are moving out. So I think there is, you almost got it, but you don't have it. So that's one thing that could be done, and, and you're talking air quality, you're talking access, accessibility to jobs, you're talking mobility, and you're also talking um, saving energy and all of that. And transit is a major option, and we have to do that, and we're one of the last few, as you mentioned, metropolitan areas in the country that doesn't have that. But the good news is seven counties in, in Michigan, including Wayne County, Washtenaw, going out west by the airport, are working on such a plan. We've got $100 million in a five-year transportation bill 
from Congresswoman Kilpatrick to begin that. Fantastic. So we're hopeful that we'll have that real soon. But we appreciate you. We've got a lot of work to do and a lot of investment we have to do in our communities and our families across this country. Let me thank my panel for coming. Thank you all. Can you give the panel a hand, please? We appreciate you. Let me thank T.C. Williams for coming out. We hope that you'll begin to grow and sprout your wings. You cannot overuse the Internet. It is something now that's taking us into a whole different direction. Going green and being healthy and educated is what we have to do. Thank you so much for coming. We'll continue discussion. Enjoy the conference. Yeah, access to information. Yeah, let's Right, right here in the middle. Excellent. I had a feeling I had to leave out of here, but this can't be the only discussion we have. Hi. Hi, Wasser. Oh, you're welcome. I'm going to dash off to the airport. I got a flight. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was enjoyable. Good question. Uh, you want to get your picture, sir? You can have them right there. You can have them right there.